I want to be conscious of everybody's time. So thank you for, uh, for joining us here. This is a, a really special day for the Department of Medicine. Uh, annually, going back almost 40 years now, 2023 will be 40 years, uh, we've given out uh, the ULIT Award. It's uh, an award that spans across the School of Medicine, and uh, we're really happy to have it housed in the, uh, in the Department of Medicine. Let me tell you a little bit about the award before I turn it over to Dr. Rich Pop, who will introduce uh, this year's winner uh, of the ULIT Award. Uh, the ULIT Award was established by one of my predecessors, Dr. Ken Melman, who was the chair of medicine from 1978 to 1984. It was named for Dr. Albion Walter Hewitt, who was the chair here at Stanford in 1916 to 1925. He was thought of as one of the outstanding clinicians of his time, but most importantly, he was thought of as one of the really early and major proponents of making sure that clinical care was connected to the science that supported that clinical care. And when it came time to select a name for the award, there was a committee of Stanford faculty who went back through the roles of, uh, of Stanford physicians and decided upon naming this after Dr. Hewlett. And it seems even 40 years later, quite appropriate to, uh, to, to combine uh, this notion of clinical care guided by science. And you can see on the slide here that the recipients are those who have made a substantial commitment to Stanford and who have consistently, I'm sorry to say that Paul, over many decades, <laughs> demonstrated the exemplary combination of a scientific approach to medicine and compassionate patient care. The selections occur via nominations from across the School of Medicine. We send out a wide call for nominations. And the discussion, as was intended in the original charter of the ULIT Award, takes place amongst prior ULIT Award winners and their, their discussion and ultimate selection of the, ULIT, of the ULIT Award is always unanimous. And that's because they spend a great, as the person who has overseen the selection for the last 10 years, they spend a great deal of time um, uh, vetting the candidates, talking about the candidates, and really thinking about their place in the history of, uh, of Stanford Medicine. It's actually quite impressive. If we could go to the next slide. Here's the winners. You go back to 1983, again, almost 40 years ago, our late friend and colleague across the Department of Medicine, Saul Rosenberg, was the initial winner. And Saul, for many years, was, I would say, the dean of the ULIT committee and really helped guide the conversation around what was the intent of the award. And uh, we miss Saul and we miss many of the, uh, our colleagues on this, uh, on this slide who have been winners over the years. But it's a, uh, it really, when I look across it, as someone who came to Stanford now 10 years ago, I've learned a lot of my history of Stanford medicine from sitting with this group and discussing uh, the place of various faculty members in the, uh, in the development of, uh, of the medical university. So we, we're incredibly honored and pleased that, uh, that Paul's in our midst. We're also pleased that he accepted the, uh, the nomination and the award this year. I look forward to uh, hearing Rich Pop's introduction, and then I look forward to, uh, to Paul's presentation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rich Pop, a former ULIT Award winner. Well, it's a great honor for me to be able to introduce my friend Paul. Um, many of you may not know him because he, his special thing is staying out of the limelight. He is the most humble guy you can imagine. And yet when I wanted to put some things together to introduce uh, and introduce him, it was <laughs> too long a list. So let me just say that he has amazing accomplishments as a wonderful clinician, teacher, inventor, educational innovator, researcher, academic leader, and visionary. And most important, He's a kind and gentle and caring man who looks on his students and his colleagues as his extended family. Well, we induced him to come back from his faculty position at UCSF to Stanford. And as expected, he is an excellent clinician, clinical cardiologist, and did a lot of interventional cardiology here. He was even acting chief of cardiology for a little while. Can't tell about that. But Paul has a special talent, and that talent <clears throat> is to look at 
any situation and see what's missing. He did the seemingly impossible task by creating the first Stanford department that bridged two different schools. Paul was the co-founder of the new <clears throat> Department of Bioengineering at Stanford. Early in Paul's career, he saw the need to, to improve ways that coronary angioplasty uh, was done. And he invented what's called the rapid exchange system. It's a new way to do angioplasty and coronary stenting. It was new then. And it basically revolutionized the way the procedure is done. And it um, is now used worldwide in basically all of the procedures. It had an enormous impact. Well, the th problem was that Paul couldn't see what was going on inside the vessel while he was fixing it. And so he thought up intravascular ultrasound. He worked with engineers to put an tra ultrasound transducer on the end of a tiny catheter that he could put in the coronary arteries or other vessels to see plaque and to see plaque pathology and to let everyone study what was going on inside the vessel and during placement of stents, et cetera. Quite a, an accomplishment. Then I must say, it's a little daunting, but Paul has had more than 50 patents. So there's been some invention going on. One of Paul's most impactful inventions is, came from his belief that you could actually teach a process of invention and innovation in biomedical uh, technology. So he got together with Josh Macauer and the two of them thought up what's now called the biodesign process. The biodesign method is, and enables teams of medical people, engineering experts, and business specialists to work together. The biodesign method is now in a major textbook, which is used as the template for dozens of biodesign programs all over the country and all over the world. The original year-long biodesign innovation fellowship was started over 20 years ago when there are literally hundreds of alumni. But Paul and his colleagues now teach five undergraduate classes with more than 250 Stanford students each year. They have a program for one of our own faculty to learn the biodesign process. And Paul has trained faculty from India, Singapore, Ireland, Japan, Israel, and others to take the biodesign process back to their countries. Well, the awards and, and honors that Paul has gotten are literally too numerous to talk, tell you here. He's been honored by many medical societies. Paul's also a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and of the National Academy of Engineering. Now, the National Academy of Engineering uh, it sponsors three of their three top awards. They're sort of considered the Nobel Prize of Engineering since there's no Nobel Prize in engineering. And over the past five years, Paul has won two of these three awards. <clears throat> the Russ Prize for Outstanding Bioengineering Achievement that improves the human condition, well-deserved. And the Gordon Prize for Innovation in Engineering and Technology Education with the biodesign process, which is now literally everywhere. Paul is the first person to win these two. Well, now Paul now turns over the leadership of the Stanford Buyer Center for Biodesign to Dr. Josh, Josh Macauer, but Paul continues to receive enormous <clears throat> love from his students, colleagues, and friends. Paul is a fine husband, father, and friend. He is truly a fine man. We do honor to him with the Hewlett Award and, and he adds luster to the award. Let's hear from Paul. You know, looking at that list of uh, prior uh, attendees is, is, is a little daunting. It's probably normal to feel uh, undeserving at, at this point, but the, the problem is I know some of those award winners and I know what they contributed to Stanford and, and to medicine and uh, well, I don't want to dwell on this because I'll psych myself out further, but, but, but uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm really uh, honored and, and thankful uh, for this award. And, and Rich um, has been a particular mentor of mine for uh, almost 40 years. This is from cardiology graduation uh, in uh, 1985. I came to Stanford because of Rich. Uh, so uh, it's a particular pleasure to, to uh, be, be greeted for this by you, Rich. I, I, my timing in my career was, was a great example of, of right time, right place. And I thought I'd reflect a little bit more on uh, what happened at Stanford uh, and in the environment during that period where we went from really uh, uh, a thin uh, representation of health technology to being uh, in this region, what most people would say is, is the top place in the world for health technology innovation. And that, that's uh, a, a fun uh, story. So uh, financial disclosures, uh, gift support, I'll talk about a few technologies. I don't have any uh, financial uh, ties, uh, ongoing ties with any of those technologies. Uh, this is a good starting point for the story uh, because there, of course, is another Hewlett uh, who's part of Stanford and Silicon Valley lore. That was actually Walter's son, uh, William, and Hewlett and Packard uh, in, the, in the late 30s started HP, which, of course, generated uh, Silicon Valley with an ongoing heavy contribution of faculty and students uh, from Stanford, a, a close uh, tie. Uh, interestingly, there wasn't much med tech or health tech in the Valley for, for decades. What was happening was a building up of infrastructure, engineering talent, uh, business, uh, legal, uh, venture capital development of, of an active venture capital unit. So when med tech started to appear, and that was really in the 70s, uh, there was an explosive growth. And here, like in the case of the computer industry, Stanford had a really outsized role, both faculty and students. And I'll, I'll mention a few of them uh, who were early on. Uh, Rodney Perkins uh, founded uh, College and Corp, went on to do another eight, nine uh, med tech uh, companies. Uh, Bill New from Anesthesia uh, pioneered the first uh, uh, pulse oximeter, started in Elcor, and that became the dominant uh, company in, in that uh, space. Um, maybe the most prolific inventor of the group, Tom uh, Fogarty, uh, who uh, uh, developed, famously developed the uh, balloon embolectomy catheter, went on to invent a number of surgical instruments, founded Fogarty Engineering, which was the first med tech uh, incubator. We'll, we'll circle back to Tom's uh, legacy in a little bit. But uh, Tom worked with Dr. Shumway, another uh, Hewlett Award winner early in his career and, and then left and has been uh, clear in talking about the fact that at least at that time, the university was not a great place for the kind of technology translation work that the real tra uh, translation work uh, that he wanted to do. That was true uh, from another pioneer that uh, from uh, the field that Bob Harrington and I are in interventional cardiology. This is John Simpson. John was a fellow uh, in cardiology at Stanford and uh, went to a noon conference uh, not far from where we're sitting, where there was a visitor from Switzerland, Andreas Grunzik, who had the crazy idea of putting a balloon catheter inside a coronary artery to, to open up the blockages. John thought that that was an amazingly good idea. Uh, unfortunately, the chief of cardiology at the time did not think it was a very good idea and didn't support John's uh, working on it. John, uh, with his own initiative, decided to fly over to Switzerland and see what was going on and actually witnessed some of the first uh, interventional cases. This is my favorite sort of history slide. This is John at the kitchen table uh, with Andreas Grunzig looking over an angiogram uh, from the cases done earlier that day. So we recently had a chance to uh, get a video recording of John reflecting back uh, on this uh, visit. 
Uh, as part of our project we've launched over the last couple of years with the Silicon Valley Archives, this is a project of the university that, that has collected uh, the stories of Hewlett and Packard and, and, and the tech pioneers, hadn't done any real uh, med tech up until this point. And so uh, we were able to uh, incent them to, to develop a new branch for med tech and that's in process. Um, and it's housed in Hoboch Hall, uh, which uh, just had a grand opening a couple of weeks ago. It's in Green Library. It's really worth visiting, fantastic uh, artifacts. Uh, and uh, as an interesting bit of small worldism, Harold Hoboch was John Simpson's patent attorney. Uh, so uh, here's John uh, reflecting back on that trip when he was a fellow. The following day, then I see the first balloon angioplasty with Martin Kaltenbach and uh, and, and Grunzig uh, do this. And they take a narrowed artery from 90% narrowing down to like 70. And I'm thinking, wow, this is absolutely amazing. So I saw several other procedures there. None of them worked perfectly, but all of them showed some improvement, uh, let's say. But it also was apparent that his catheter was really hard to use. And that almost beyond grunting, nobody seemed to be able to make it really kind of work. And I, it did go through my mind even at that time. And I was trained by a radiologist named Lee Wexler uh, at Stanford. And uh, radiologists rely heavily on guide wires to position everything over guide wire first. And then, uh, but Grunzig's catheter did not have a guide wire that you could move. And I thought, being trained by a radiologist, you know, we should have a, a balloon catheter that we're going to use in the coronary arteries. It should have a guide wire that we can move and so we can track in and out over this guide wire. So that was my contribution. And, and it did come out of an observation that nobody can make Grunzig system work. So John uh, came back to Stanford. Um, he lived in Menlo Park. He didn't have a garage, so he couldn't do the true Silicon Valley uh, thing. But but in his den, he fabricated uh, this catheter along with his his uh, colleague Ned Robert, and together uh, they decided to start a company around this and got some that really the first venture capital funding for a med tech project to found uh, ACS or Advanced Cardiovascular Systems. Uh, you may recognize this building was uh, the old uh, original Intel uh, building, and, and now if you drive by it on 101, you'll see that it's uh, Abbott Medical Devices after a series of acquisitions. But this company really was the granddaddy of MedTech in Silicon Valley. People trained, it got very big, very successful, and spawned uh, a number of other companies. Fast forward now, unofficially, there are 5,000 health technology companies within a 50 mile radius of, of where we're sitting. A lot of them, small startups, but, but this is mission control, mission central uh, for health tech uh, innovation. So uh, as Rich alluded to, uh, my story sort of intersected uh, with John at, at this point, um, Stanford, John had had left Stanford, not being encouraged to start angioplasty here, went to Sequoia Hospital. And uh, the, the fellows, all of us uh, in training were really excited about angioplasty, wanted to get training. So, so I asked Rich, who was the, the chief of cardiology at that point, if I could take a leave of absence and go to Sequoia uh, to train in angioplasty. And so I this was before there were angioplasty fellowships, but I was able to start doing some cases with John. And honestly, I struggled uh, learning the, the technique. And part of that was my, uh, my, my skill level. But part of it, I thought, was the equipment was just not uh, optimized. Uh, at, at the time, the system that, that uh, ACS was making had a 10-foot guide wire and that was awkward. It required two people to, to do the procedure and uh, communication between the two. And we wound up losing the guide wire a lot of the time. And so it occurred to me that there might be a better way to, to do this. And in particular, that the, um, the guide wire did not need to be uh, inside the, the, the balloon catheter, except when it's uh, in the artery. 
And if you took the guide wire out of the catheter somewhere, uh, uh, you know, inside the guiding catheter and had the, the guide wire and the catheter be separate outside, then one person could do the angioplasty, right hand, left hand, knew what each other were doing, be simpler, faster, a little safer, not losing the guide wire. Uh, so uh, I uh, licensed that uh, technology to ACS. And uh, as was the, the case frequently in those days, we did initial testing uh, in Europe. There was a very talented young clinical specialist uh, running that testing um, who uh, two years later in, in a lapse of her usual judgment agreed to marry me uh, <laughs> and uh, went on to, to you know, masterfully run our household. And by the way, come back to biodesign and teach health economics. But uh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of the story a little bit. Um, the other problem we were working with, with angioplasty, and Rich alluded to this, uh, was that uh, the dilations were coming back in an alarming number of cases, re really more like 40%. And I did have the feeling that we just weren't seeing clearly enough uh, to know uh, what was happening inside the artery. And so given the background I had from uh, Rich and ultrasound, it made sense to me that ultrasound would be a, a technique uh, that would be able to see through the plaque and give us higher resolution. Uh, so it would be something like this, that, that you'd be able to rotate a transducer uh, in, inside the artery and uh, carve out an image. Let's see if I can point here. So. Uh, it would look something like this, where this black hole is where the blood is flowing. This is the buildup of, of cheeseburgers uh, in the artery. Uh, and this is the normal part of the artery wall. Well, that was the vision. It turned out to be technically uh, very challenging and it required starting a company with uh, which John Simpson and Tom Fogarty helped me to do. Um, took a couple of years to, to wrestle with the technology. And at that point, we were ready to uh, test it in humans. And I tried to call up the FDA and, and get a feeling for what this was gonna take and how long it was gonna take. And it probably won't surprise you to hear that, that there wasn't a definitive answer about how long it was gonna take. Um, so I had a friend uh, from cardiology from Stanford uh, who had gone to Norway uh, to do uh, his initial clinical work. And I was talking with him on the phone and I said, just out of curiosity, you know, how long uh, would it take to do this in, in Norway? And he called back a couple of weeks later and he said, it's okay. Uh, and I, I said, what do you mean it's okay? And he said, you know, I talked to the guy in the government who, who makes these decisions. And so we went on over to Trondheim <laughs> and uh, did, did the first human cases. Um, You'll, you'll be forgiven if, if you can't see much in this uh, image. And in fact, when I brought this back to show to Dr. Fogarty, Dr. Fogarty also couldn't see much. In fact, I, I will always remember his saying, you know, Paul, I can't see bleep in this, this uh, <laughs> image. Uh, it looks like a hurricane off the coast of Miami. Um, but happily, the images got better, the catheters got smaller, and, and we did solve that uh, problem of what was going on to cause the recurrence rate. The working theory was that there was a, a scarring, a buildup of intimal proliferation. It turned out something very bizarre uh, was going on, and that is a, a local shrinkage of the whole vessel. We were winding up uh, insulting the adventitia, and it, it was uh, shrinking down. And uh, happily, there was a technology emerging at the same time that was going to take care of that problem. Uh, that is stenting. Uh, stenting had its own slightly rocky start because there was a, a thrombosis problem early on, pretty serious one. And it turned out that with intravascular ultrasound, we, we saw what was happening, that we weren't deploying the stents at high enough pressures, that they, they weren't opening enough. So this was a uh, work that a number of groups did. We worked hard on it up at UCSF. Um, and another bit of small worldism, one of the really critical people there uh, w was a fellow who, who worked with me uh, on these studies, 
uh, a guy named Peter Fitzgerald, who had been an engineer in Rich's lab and was a roommate of Bob Harrington in, at medical school. So uh, in the mid 90s, uh, Steve Osterley and Victor Zhao decided that they liked this technology and, and wanted us to come down. And so, so we uh, joined the faculty and uh, ultimately Peter ran the uh, intravascular ultrasound laboratory now uh, run by Yasu Honda. Uh, but I, I wanted to, to take another tack because the, the, the reason I wanted to come back to Stanford was I thought it might be a, a place to replicate the kind of mentoring that I had had. But the things that I learned hanging around with Tom Fogarty and, and John Simpson were not anything like what was going on in the university. There was a whole other world there of, of real technology translation uh, that I thought our, our fellows, our students should have an exposure to. So was there some way of, of doing that? And it turned out that there was a crowd of faculty at Stanford who uh, had the same ideas. And we formed a group called the Medical Device uh, Network you'll recognize, some of you will recognize the names here. All of these folks have gone on to invent technologies, co-found, found the companies, but, but this already was a remarkable uh, group of faculty here. And we put together a number of courses. Uh, we worked with OTL to do a, uh, a invention uh, challenge. Uh, and uh, uh, then in the late 90s, another opportunity presented itself. So uh, the Building 10, the, the president wanted to uh, develop a interdisciplinary program that would bridge particularly medicine and engineering uh, and put up a new building. And the, the code name for the, this new institute was gonna be BioX, bio something anyway. So, we, uh, the, the gizmologists uh, on the faculty decided that we would pitch uh, BioX uh, to the deans with this kind of concept that we wanted to combine education about technology translation with a real sincere effort to do it right, to do it like they do it in the real world. And those together would make a program in the vertical uh, of uh, med tech. So the bioengineering department was starting to take shape at this point. And uh, it would turn out to be an important uh, fuel for the translational side of what we're doing, uh, specifically with uh, the Coulter grant. So Scott Delp led the department, led us to get the uh, $20 million Coulter award, which jump-started our effort to fuel translation, provide funding. You'll see that Harry Greenberg was on this committee as a past uh, winner, and Brooke Byers, uh, who continues to be an advisor uh, to us today. So that, that was the translational side. On the educational side, uh, we wanted to, to surf the wave of a powerful uh, discipline that, that was coming on board at Stanford, and that was design thinking. David Kelly, uh, was a founder of IDO. He was in the process of uh, founding the D School. And this conceptual framework of, of uh, user-centered design was very familiar to what I had heard from Dr. Simpson, and Dr. Fogarty, that, that in order to invent successfully, you need to go to the patient. You need to understand the needs of the patient, the needs uh, of the system. So we wanted to kind of hook our wagon on this as a, as a teaching uh, framework. And it was Scott Delp who suggested, we, we were trying to decide what do we call ourselves to pitch to the deans? And he said, well, we're biodesign, right? We, we, we do design of uh, technologies. So uh, started to put together some funding, wanted to do a fellowship uh, program as, as the first thing that we did. And, uh, you know, um, uh, Dave Kelly would, would want me to point out that this design thinking, the, the, the focus on needs, really didn't originate with, with him. It originated with his professor, Bob McKim, who really put the design program on the map at Stanford and is the person who pioneered needs-based uh, design. 
he had a colleague up in Berkeley, Horst Rattel, who said, you know, there are certain class of problems, uh, he called them wicked problems, where it's really tough to do user-centered design because there are so many stakeholders involved uh, in, in the configuration. And he cited health as the best example of a wicked design uh, problem, and, and he was right. This is a slide we show a lot to our students, we, we, and we say, look, it would be great if we could uh, just design technologies for the patient or the patient provider interface, but we have all of these other stakeholders that will influence whether a technology makes it through or not to patient care. We have the payers, we have the regulators, uh, we have the physician societies, and the priorities of all of these groups uh, change depending on what the political environment is. And so it's a very complicated uh, system and it means you have to get the, the, the needs right. So these ideas were rumbling around uh, among us and uh, enter Josh Mackauer. So Josh uh, had just moved out uh, to do his first company and uh, we, we had a breakfast at Il Fornao, this is kind of a reenactment about 10 years later, but we had a breakfast where, you know, I was talking about, gee, we'd like to create this fellowship. And, and Josh said, I know how to do that. Uh, he had, uh, in his first job at Pfizer, had uh, studied, the, the CEO asked him to study, why is it that Pfizer can't innovate and all of these startup companies can? And Josh studied it, interviewed a bunch of uh, folks uh, who, who were successful startup uh, uh, experts. And the answer had to do with getting the need right. And, and Josh went on to develop a internship uh, for, for teaching needs-based design in our space and happily was available to, uh, to take over as the fellowship director at, at Stanford and get us launched uh, with the fellowship program. He had some significant help. So the, the team on the screen uh, helped flesh out uh, the, the program, uh, Stefano Zinos from the business school. And then uh, really, I'd say the unsung hero of, of uh, Biodesign, uh, Lynn Dennant, who is maybe more than anybody responsible for the excellence and, and the, the spread of our, of our teaching uh, materials. So besides the textbook, there's a video series, some 300 videos, there's an open source student guide. And as Rich alluded to, this has spread uh, very widely, uh, is used now by a bunch of universities around the, around the world. We also had some master teachers of the, of the process. So I picked three of the past uh, Hewlett Award winners who've had heavy lifts uh, with biodesign. So Rich went on to become the director of ethics and policy. Uh, Mark Blumenkrantz uh, is heavily involved in the faculty fellows program, and Tom Crummel started a surgical innovation program. We partnered with him, and he went on to be a co-director uh, of uh, biodesign. You've heard uh, from me, from Josh, about the process. I'm not going to dwell on this. The, the core is in the purple part of uh, identifying and characterizing needs. Uh, everything we do uh, uses interdisciplinary teams uh, for discovery. And we purposefully, part of the secret sauce is that we uh, separate out needs finding and needs screening from the inventing process and pay as much or more attention to getting the need right. The way to do that again, borrowing from design thinking, is to consider lots of different needs and make them compete and filter them and have it come down to uh, a few really good ideas that, that will go ahead. A couple of tools that, that uh, Josh helped develop, a need statement, a, a single sentence description of what the need is and, and need criteria. Before you get to a solution, just really understand what the criteria for a good solution uh, would be. This is a, my favorite quote from our uh, fellow teams ever. It says, given enough time, sugar, and caffeine, you will invent something. And that, that's true. We give our fellows a guarantee that if they get the need right, they will wind up uh, with a solution that, that makes sense and has a shot at going forward. And we say that with confidence because we've had 
a lot of uh, good ideas going forward from our fellow teams. So we've been at that for, for about 20 years. Uh, there are now 54 companies who have started from, th these fellows are first timers. They, they don't have an idea coming into the program. They come in and we put them in an area of medicine and they try to invent in that area. Uh, and they've done very well. This represents uh, $1.1 billion in, in funds raised, uh, but more importantly, there are patients benefiting. So each year graduation, we tally up how many patients have received a, a technology coming directly from our program. And, and uh, last June, we were up over 7 million uh, patients. We do emphasize though, that the real product is not those technologies. It's, it's the people being trained, going off into different careers some of them in the industry. Uh, there are another 50 companies that have started from our trainees after they have left us. A number of them go to academic jobs. So we have uh, 10 of our alums who are on the faculty at Stanford in medicine and engineering. We have a number who have started programs at other distinguished universities that are biodesign like programs. And interestingly, from, a, from an ecosystem standpoint, there are 30 of our alums who are CEOs of the startups uh, uh, that they have created. And this is an incredible secret weapon for us from a teaching standpoint. And it's powerful from a network standpoint. So the, the faculty people and the industry people have a robust uh, alumni organization. They meet frequently. And it's become, didn't anticipate this happening, but it's become a really powerful uh, benefit of the program. Uh, Rich mentioned there's a, a faculty fellows program, a number of graduate and undergraduate classes. And uh, Rich mentioned the international uh, programs that we've developed uh, over the years, uh, all of whom have trained hundreds of students and fellows now at this point. There are a number of really good technologies that, that have emerged uh, from those international programs. So I want to uh, shift gears and talk about uh, what's changing. You heard from Josh uh, a, a, a little earlier in, in the fall about one of the main emphasis that he has going forward, which is to uh, understand and try to shape policy as it reads on health technology innovation. And uh, he is uh, getting some help in shaping that program by somebody whose face you may recognize. Uh, she spent a lot of time in your living rooms uh, as a commentator for MSNBC uh, on COVID especially, but Kavita Patel uh, is helping Josh to form up uh, the program. She, she's a uh, fantastic expert in health policy. Uh, we'll be working with uh, Doug Owens and their group uh, in spinning up the policy side of uh, biodesign. So, uh, deep experience in the, in the Obama administration and, and just a terrific uh, candidate for us. I wanna focus on two other things though that, that you'll hear more from Josh uh, during the coming couple of years. Two other things I just wanna highlight. One is uh, despite uh, a lot of good outcomes uh, over, the, over the past 20 years, we, we have consistently heard from our fellows uh, and our faculty that we don't do enough to help with the hard job of taking a technology uh, forward. Uh, you know, like lots of universities, we uh, give too much emphasis to the invention part of things, not enough emphasis to the, to the hard work of translation. A great idea is not anywhere near good enough. There are all of these uh, areas that you need to understand and you need to have experts uh, to help you carry on. And so uh, we are making some significant process, uh, progress, I would say, in this area. Uh, one is a relatively new program called Catalyst, which has the idea of let's really take advantage of what's at Stanford, especially clinically, find those projects where we can give a significant boost by plugging it into the Stanford system, give them some uh, funding to do that, and that synergy, I think, is going to be very powerful. That's inside of Stanford, outside of Stanford in the health tech space. So, so Fogarty Innovation is an evolution of Dr. Fogarty's uh, original uh, incubator. 
And it is now a fantastic collection of experts uh, down in Mountain View who understand the blocking and tackling in those critical areas that I mentioned. And we, we have a partnership uh, with them that's called the Innovation Accelerator Program. Andrew Cleland is the, is the CEO, uh, where selected projects from Stanford are uh, given a six month boost with all of that expertise that's resident at Fogarty Innovation to, to really give them a significant uh, launch. There's some uh, folks here from Fogarty Innovation uh, and this has been a absolutely wonderful uh, partnership. The final uh, thing that is changing and certainly needs to change uh, more is DEI in our uh, sector. And there are a couple of programs that Josh and Gordon Saul uh, are spinning up at this point that they'll tell you more about uh, as they take shape. I wanna go a little more uh, broader this morning and just mention that historically, uh, we have done a really poor job with health technology innovation in focusing on underserved populations uh, focusing on women for, for that matter. We, uh, cycling back to uh, 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 oximetry, this just surfaced uh, in the last year that there is uh, strong data to indicate that in dark skinned people, pulse oximetry is less accurate than in Caucasians. It's just one example of, of a host of areas where we just have not paid attention. So we're in the process of uh, modifying the by design process at each of the steps to, first of all, have our fellows and students do explicit needs finding with underserved uh, populations. Second, when, when the ideas start to flow, when the solutions uh, come out, check those solutions. Is there reason to believe that that will work as well in underserved populations? Is there reason to believe that access is a problem with those populations? And then thirdly, uh, test it. Make sure that in your testing, if you're taking this ad into commercial development, that, that you test that in, in those kinds of populations. It's not just the products that we have to worry about. It's the people who are doing technology innovation. Uh, so I mentioned 5,000 companies uh, in the Bay Area. We did an informal survey a few years ago, uh, prompted by what we were hearing about the terrible underrepresentation of minorities in the tech industry, notoriously bad, right? So my assumption going into that was that health tech was gonna be better. That because you know we all take care of patients uh, across the spectrum, that uh, the, the people in the industry would be more representative. It's not true. Uh, unfortunately, we look just as bad uh, as the rest of tech. And so uh, in response to that, in partnership uh, with Fogarty, we launched a new initiative uh, called Diversity by Doing with the idea that the startup companies, some of the bigger health tech companies have the resources to do a serious DEI uh, program and they are making progress. The startups, frankly, don't, and they're starting from a severe deficit of people who represent underserved communities. And so we wanted to develop an organization that, that could help that, especially with the regional companies. Uh, happily, we were able to recruit a wonderful executive director, Ingrid Ellerby, uh, and have worked on a few uh, uh, important uh, projects. In the inclusion space, speed mentoring and, and a seminar series for these companies, for the people in the companies who need some resources about how to uh, uh, increase inclusion uh, in their group. Um, two other programs, there's a summer innovation series. Janine Fursh is in the audience. She's helping to run this. Uh, the idea is these companies have a robust internship programs Let's help them recruit uh, minority candidates into those programs. And then let's give them a cohort uh, when they're here. And so the idea is that there's a summer program that, that pulls together uh, those uh, folks. 
and uh, gives them a sense of community and some programming uh, to help and hopefully gets them back out here to the Valley to be parts of those companies. And then a final thing that we're launching in January in community colleges. So, so there are, as you well know, very talented young people, uh, STEM students who have started in community college and are distinguishing themselves. And we wanna identify those people, find the ones who are interested in health tech careers and give them a little extra boost, give them help in transferring to a four-year college and get them excited about a health technology career. So uh, work in progress, uh, happy to tell you more about it. That uh, brings me uh, to the end of uh, Grand Rounds and, and actually to the end of my time on faculty. So my last day is uh, December 31st here. Uh, this is not the time to, to have a formal uh, goodbye of any sort, but I just wanna say uh, I, uh, again, am deeply grateful for, for this award. Uh, I uh, feel enormously lucky to have been at this place at, at this time uh, and, and around uh, these uh, people. So uh, I, I'm leaving with some great memories uh, and I'll, I'll leave you with uh, a wish for happy holidays uh, and uh, thank you for your friendship and support. It's really great to have such a wonderful attendance in person, by the way. This is awesome. Dr. Jack, thank you so much. We have um, uh, time for some questions, about 10, 15 minutes. And also for those of you online, we also have a great attendance online as well. So any questions online, please feel free to ask. So I'll, I'll gauge the room first. Any questions? Oh, Dr. Harrington. Well, Paul, first off, congratulations. The department is uh, really pleased that you joined that long list of outstanding um, Stanford Medicine faculty, so thank you. And uh, I'm looking around as one of the few interventional cardiologists in the room. I'm also especially pleased that, uh, that one of my colleagues from interventional cardiology is here. Um, you, you talked a lot about, about the changes. You talked a lot a bit about the opportunity. If you think about the future of med tech innovation at a place like Stanford or any other of the major universities that are doing these programs, What's the greatest threat to continuing this? So uh, there are a couple of ways to answer that question. Channeling my inner Josh, I, I would say that, that practically speaking, the greatest threat is reimbursement for the technologies that, that we invent. That, that, that is the major roadblock right now that, that uh, both Medicare and the insurance companies have no incentive financially to allow new technologies to, to come up. So, so that's, that's a battle and that's why uh, wrestling with policy is, is important. From a university standpoint, I, I do think, uh, I'm gonna exaggerate this a little bit, but, but there's a lot of naivete out there in, in terms of what translation actually means uh, and, and what it takes to, to take a good idea forward. And I, I, I tried to mention that it really is a whole set of uh, extra uh, expertise and experience that you have to bring to bear on it. And it is not good enough to have once a quarter somebody coming in from industry and, and you know, giving you some advice. It's a intensive uh, 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 um, takes a lot of people with a lot of expertise to do it right. And, and I think you see this around the country as we go around, lots of people building, lots of universities building fancy spaces and giving out money. And they just don't understand that, how hard it is to take the next step. Thank you. Any questions in here? Oh, here's been just positive. Oh, Dr. Valentine just asked this up here. Paul, congratulations on an astounding career and for the opportunity to collaborate with you on IVAS and heart transplantation in the heart transplantation population. Your new directions, uh, DXD is outstanding and much needed. Can you predict for us how long it might take to get DEI fully integrated into MedTech? Not only who is doing the work, but what research is being done and who can get access to the benefits? Many thanks, Dr. Valentine. Well, I feel like I'd like to ask Hannah to answer that rather than, than uh, so uh, he, here's my feeling. We are, we are starting from a really uh, 
frankly bad position uh, in, in the Valley and in the industry in, in general. And I think it's going to take a long time. Uh, and I think th the uh, place to, to work most is on the, the pipeline of talented uh, young people uh, going in. We have to work on inclusion as well. It's equally important. But that's why we've decided to, to double down our efforts on finding uh, young people and, and bringing them in uh, to these companies. Um, and, and the good news is the companies are really motivated now in a, in a way that I, I haven't seen before. And, and the startups that we're working with are really, we just had a meeting last night uh, where we had a, a, a group of volunteers from local startup companies who are really passionate about trying to make this better. So the energy is there uh, in a way that it hasn't been before. Great, I'll go over to Michelle Barry, and then I have a few also online. Hi, Paul. It's been an absolute honor and privilege to be able to work with you. Um, I have a question for you about reverse um, innovation. There's been a lot of discussion about that in, from low-income countries and how to be able to scale that up. You've been great, both of you, uh, actually looking in lower income countries and sending biodesign fellows there. But what kind of infrastructure can we set up there that they can scale up as well? Well, I think you said something critical, which it has to be there, right? The, the, the thing that, that we've learned and reconfirmed is that you really need to build up the local resources to, to do this well. And it's different in, in each place. Our deepest experience, as you know, is in India. And, and there we have finally, after 10 years of, of hard work, figured out that the, the best leverage point is with the, <clears throat> excuse me, state governments and their processes for reimbursing technologies. And, and we now have, I think, a pretty effective program. Raj Doshi is leading this for getting access to those state governments uh, and, and providing a system. But that's the, the, the key thing is we're not able to do a whole lot from here. It has to be on the ground in those countries and customized uh, to the systems that exist in those uh, countries, both, both the business systems and the government systems. I have a few questions online. I'm going to jump to one, but there's a lot of upvotes. Then I'm going to go up there to back to in-house. Um, a question that's kind of from Gil Chu asks, uh, he says, thank you for a beautiful tour through your career in biomedical innovation. Strikingly, some of your first triumphs occurred in Europe. By contrast, a similar effort by Martin Klein uh, for gene therapy elicited condemnation from the NIH in the 1980s. Can you comment on the difference? So I, I, I don't know the example that, that he's talking about specifically. Um, what, what I will say uh, is that uh, it, when, when we started, there was a climate uh, of concern uh, about uh, too much entrepreneurship in the, in the health technology space. And it was triggered by some really egregious examples uh, of, you know, faculty and universities uh, who, who crossed the line from, a, from an ethical uh, standpoint. I think in Europe, that had not been as much of an issue. They hadn't had as much difficulty. Now, though, the, the pendulum has switched. I think we've got it about right in, in the US in terms of pretty careful conflict of interest uh, rules, but still the ability to, to take things ahead. And FDA now is really prioritizing uh, first in America testing uh, with uh, some creative programs. So I, I feel more optimistic about where the balance is now. Thank you very much. I'm going to run the mic up now to the back room. I want to thank everybody online as well for all the great questions. Please do keep upvoting. So we'll try to get to the ones the most popular. Paul, first, thanks for being the best uh, partner, buddy, um, on how to be uh, inventor, scholar, teacher. Um, I've really learned so much from you. This is Scott Delp, by the way, who started the bioengineering program. So so the question I have is a follow-up on universities not getting it. 
one of the things that surprised me in the last few years is turnaround engineering schools. They're starting companies in the university. So they're facing the reality and the companies are just sitting in the engineering school with students working on it, totally conflicted. Everybody's conflicted. I'm wondering what your take is on that awakening. Yeah, well, um, there is a, uh, a tsunami of enthusiasm for, for translation uh, in, in campuses now, both medical campuses and engineering campuses. And uh, I think uh, it needs to be managed really carefully. Uh, th there's a reason that all of those careful conflict of interest uh, provisions were, were in place. Uh, and and we, we, this is a, a pendulum uh, thing, I think. Uh, there are places that are swinging a little far on the loose side, uh, I would say. Uh, but it's a healthy dynamic. I'm, I'm glad that places are experimenting with these different models. Um, and one thing I'd say, you know, we are so spoiled being in Silicon Valley and being able to have the expertise that we have uh, at our doorstep. I hope it doesn't make us lazy because I, I do think that there are universities who are starting to get it right out, out there. And, and we need to keep innovating our processes as well. Scott's point there was that, that uh, you know, uh, I, I used to say, and I think I still agree, that, that uh, universities may blow it by keeping the technology in too long. Uh, and, and that's true. There, there are certain, uh, it, it's an art to figure out what the right time is to, to exit. And it's certainly, like with Catalyst, it's smart to take advantage of the, the Stanford resources while you can. Uh, from a business standpoint, too, but but just when to release uh, is is a, a subtle uh, decision. A couple of questions here. I'm going to combine as we near the end. Uh, Dr. Leibowitz asked, and he says, "Thank you for an inspiring discussion. Many of us know young people interested in bio design, uh, biomedical design. Who should they contact among those of you mentioned to obtain?" Uh, mentoring at all levels, high school, college, and beyond. There's just also, is there a mechanism by, by Murray, Dr. Solomon, is there a mechanism to submit ideas from the outside? A lot of interest. Yeah, so uh, I would say in terms of by design folks to contact, Josh uh, is one, and Lynn Denon, who's our academic program director, would be a good good person. As far as ideas and what to do about them, Gordon Saul is our executive director, and he runs our translational programs, and he has an unbelievable network. Uh, so he's, that's S-A-U-L, uh, and you can track him down. And if they're okay with it, we can send that in the follow-up uh, yeah. email yeah. as well. Yeah. All your contacts. Um, we're, we're hitting <laughs> we're hitting nine o'clock now. We, since we have a lot of people online, as well as everyone, we respect everybody's time. Unless there's any more questions, I'll close. So I just wanna, again, thank, everybody, thank you uh, for Dr. Pop for being here for introductions. Uh, thank you for, for everything you've done for us. And uh, it's great to see this amazing history. Thank you for everybody being here in person. It's so wonderful to have grand rounds, both in person and online. Um, I do want to just note there was a lot of lot more questions and comments saying how wonderful this talk was. I, I'll probably take a few minutes to go through everything, but a lot of comments here I'm happy to send you later. Um, and that being said, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Next week, we do have our last grand rounds of the year. It will be on Zoom only, and uh, we'll send more for about that. But again, thank you, everybody, for being here. Have a great rest of the day. Congratulations. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.